Hey, I'm gonna um, keep us moving here since we're getting towards the end of our time and I wanna make sure that we um, hit all the topics. Um, so we'll come back to some more questions here in a minute, but I wanted to give, um, <clears throat> give uh, Leah a chance to talk a little bit about um, some of your findings and your recommendations um, for connecting with audiences. We, we found that's really important to understand your audience, to be able to connect with them. So, so maybe you could talk about some of the ways that, um, that we can effectively do that. Yeah, that, um, so Dr. Nixon's comments were a perfect segue to this section because I really wanted to focus on the importance of our social groups, our normative influences, our social norms, and really those who research suggests have the most power to impact our health and our scientific um, reception of information, but then also like our actual behavior decision making. So the first one is identifying trusted influencers. Who does your audience trust to positively influence decision making? And we can see um, this coming in with masks as well, right? Like um, I remember in some of the podcasts that I did with Dr. Nixon um, during the spring semester and then also with other colleagues at UVU, we were finding a lot of research that was showing that um, individuals did not want to wear masks. Perhaps there were some who were of the mindset that their rights were being infringed on, but really um, there were miscommunications about the importance of masks with vital family members or they weren't able to get information about it from family members. And I also have done um, a lot of research on this topic with things like reproductive testing, prenatal healthcare testing and things of that nature. And overwhelmingly, I have found in my research that friends and family members are going to be the most important sources of information and influence, not necessarily scientists or medical providers. Like one I did with prenatal testing, for example, even if women got a particular diagnosis about Down syndrome or another genetic abnormality, they were less likely to go through testing, not because of what their doctor said, but because a cousin or a friend or a family member didn't want them to go through it or had a particular experience that ebbed them in the other direction. So number one factor here, who are the influencers? Um, the second strategy that kind of goes back to what doctors Mackesy and Nixon have been saying is what are the preferred media outlets, right? Where does your audience prefer to get their information? And I've seen several amazing questions in the chat box that we haven't um, gotten to yet that look at um, how COVID related information in journals is now free, um, but you know how much do lay individuals or non-academic individuals go to journal articles, right? Where do they go first? Is it Fox, is it CNN? Um, in my own communication research methods class that I also teach um, in conjunction with Dr. Maxey, a lot of my students picked news articles as their first foremost place to go. And I'm like, well, hey, have you checked the CDC website? And they were like, come again? <laughs> so um, it's, it's an easy little friendly reminder about widening the playing field with the preferred media outlets. Um, and then also building rapport with your audiences is communication 101. And it goes without saying that um, the social norms, the literacy levels, and the cultural backgrounds are tremendously important. So for example, when the COVID mandates were starting to come out about masks and social distancing, um, several of us thought that masks would be an easy fix and how wrong were we when we started seeing the infringement of civil liberties coming out. But we also started to see some of the cultural disconnects with the recommendation of social distancing, particularly when we think about how um, Hispanic Latino families, like I am Mexican American, for example, like how Hispanic Latino families tend to have several extended family members under one roof. And when we think about um, required laborers, individuals who did not have the opportunity to work at home, the mandate of social distancing and self quarantining wasn't exactly a feasible one for particular groups of particular backgrounds. So I think taken together when we think about social norms, um, media literacy levels and also cultural backgrounds, then we can get a better hold on our target audience and how we can work with them more effectively. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to um, skip ahead just a bit. I want to make sure we have time for questions because it seems that there's um, quite a few comments and questions coming in. And um, I, I think those are important to get to. So I had kind of, um, in my conversations with all three of our panelists, had kind of uh, summarized my top three takeaways, I guess. And so um, I thought I'd go through those and then we'll give everyone a chance to wrap up and take questions. So 
I think it's important to realize that um, while not everyone is science savvy, um, there seems to be a general belief that science is important based on the statistics that um, Dr. Mackesy shared earlier. And um, I think that's really important because that gives us a, a positive atmosphere that we're working in when we, when we do communicate science to um, lay audiences. Obviously, understanding your audience, gaining trust, and meeting them where they like to get their information are all very critical um, steps in the communication process. And finally, people are likely going to react negatively when told what to do by someone they don't know or trust. And so this takes us back to um, building trust with your audience. If, if, if you're in a space that's not familiar to you, then inviting someone who is a trusted expert among that population to deliver your message is um, definitely a, an alternative that you might want to think about. So, um, so just, we don't necessarily have to deliver every one of our messages to every audience. We can, we can work with others who um, are more familiar with that culture, that audience, and, and are more likely to be heard by those audiences. So with that, I, I asked each of our panelists to provide me just um, a couple of their tips that they wanted to end on. And so um, I'll let each of them just maybe give a one minute um, wrap up on your tips from today, and then we'll spend the remainder of our time taking questions. Cool. Yeah, so um, I've already talked a little bit about the importance of understanding the target audience's levels of health literacy and scientific literacy, which, as we've discussed, can be very similar, but also very different. Um, and the importance of communicating in such a way that the audience, one, has access to, and then two, can understand. But I wanted to touch on the importance of using narrative a bit. And, you know, we've talked a lot about narrative and emotions and metaphor. And um, I've done some research in the past about the use of narrative theory with the CDC in communicating health information. And we found that conveying health information and statistics through a narrative format where we use metaphor, other linguistic techniques, um, allows the transportation to happen to where individuals react to it more positively and also more deeply when they can see themselves in that situation. Um, and this is something we can talk about in the Q&A later, but um, as a communication person, I am a huge proponent of narrative and storytelling, particularly for um, various cultural groups who use storytelling as one of their main modes of communicating with each other. Very good, thank you. Um, Kari, would you like to give us just maybe a one minute wrap up? Yeah, um, as I've already mentioned and Dr. Hernandez mentioned, um, narrative is a huge way to overcome the human inability to imagine very large and very small things. It also gives people a way to sort of um, experiment imaginatively with different outcomes through a story. Um, and then the storyteller isn't necessarily discredited when they say, well, what would happen if somebody did this? What would happen if somebody did this? Changing outcomes don't discredit you in a narrative or storytelling format. Um, but then again, as I've said, using agentive versus non-agentive language, not making people feel like a finger is pointed at them, particularly in polarizing or politicized issues is highly important to sort of sidestep that human tendency to just resist or fight back. That's, I'll stop there so we can have time. Okay, very good. Um, and Megan, I'll give you just a minute here to wrap up as well. Yeah, so I guess my main uh, takeaway is this is hard. What we are talking about, this effective science communication is difficult. Um, we are in this constantly inundated uh, environment where we're just getting information all the time. So how do you get your messages to stick and capture people's attention? Um, Larry Page, who's one of the co-founders of Google, said that science has a marketing problem. So that's what we need to think about. How do we market and target our messages to break through all this noise? Um, so I have here the, the Golden Rules of Science Communication, which was created by Dr. Christopher Wolpe, who is a founding member of Science Counts, which is this nonprofit that conducts public opinion research supporting science. So he came up with these kind of golden rules. Uh, so the first is to know thyself. 
so what is what is your objective with your communication? And then how are you perceived by your audience? Um, often what we are trying to say, we think it's coming out great and other people are hearing it differently. Um, and then the second is to know thy audience. So who they are, what's important to them. Um, and those, uh, knowing your audience can lead back to those narratives that Dr. Hernandez and Dr. Nixon were talking about. So I'll leave it there.